Please pray with me. <clears throat> Let the words of our mouths and the mediums of our heart be acceptable to you, O Lord. <clears throat> be our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> our first gospel reading comes from the book of Mark, and <clears throat> it can be found on page 1566, 1566 of your pew Bible. And I'll be reading <clears throat> in the chapter 8, verses 27 through um, 38. <clears throat> Peter's Confession of Christ. Jesus and his disciples were on, <clears throat> onto the villages around Caesar Philippi. And on the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, so, and still others, one of them prophets. But what about you, he said, what do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them <clears throat> that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, <clears throat> and that he must be killed and after three days arise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. <clears throat> you are not, you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For <clears throat> whomever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous, sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes into the Father's glory with the holy angels. The word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Our scripture passage today comes again from James. We're in our part three of the part five series in James, and we're at the time of the taming of the tongue, as that verse, that chapter is called. It's James 3, verses 1 through 12. Let us listen to God speak. James says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with the bridle. If we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to dry them, yet they move by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also is the tongue a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And though the tongue is a fire, the tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. By every species of beast and bird, a reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and curse. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish waters? Can a fig tree 
my brothers and sisters yield olives or a grapevine figs. No more can salt water yield fresh. The word of our Lord, thanks be to God. In my junior year of college, I was an RA, the resident assistant for a floor of freshman girls. The time period, if I can set the scene, was in the early 2000s. To paint this picture a little bit more, I need to lay out for you the technological landscape that was of that time period. Just two years before I was an RA, my parents bought me, get it, a gateway desktop computer for my college dorm, complete with that chunky and clunky, heavy desktop screen so that I can go to college with and be prepared. It took up, I swear, at least half of the SUV that was also taking my belongings to college too. Now, by the time I was an RA and the college freshmen showed up in their dorms, they were so lucky, I thought, because now they invented the flat screen uh, monitors. A lot more desk space. That was all in vogue. It was also in time in which cell phones were widely prevalent, but they were the kind in which, you know, you could call and rudimentarily text people with. In fact, not all students actually at college at this time had a cell phone. And in fact, we still had landlines in our college dormitories. Crazy, I know. And there, you could only have to dial the last four digits of your friend's room at college and get connected with them. This was also the time of period that existed in which we were on the precipice of camera phones. And I am not kidding you to say that the argument in the college campus of that era was whether that feature was absolutely necessary or even very much helpful. I remember saying, who would want a camera on their phone? It's crazy, right? My year of being an RA was also set in a time period in which Napster was the rage where you could illegally download all the music you want from your friends. And we had no idea that it was really illegal until they shut it down. For we were years removed from when iTunes would save our downloading day for a dollar a song. It was also a time in which instant messengers and messaging was available on the computer where it was how we stayed connected with our classmates across campus, to our friends from high school, and to our phones. Because remember, in those days, when you had a cell phone, you only had X amount of minutes, right? And if you called out of like, long distance, it was expensive on your phone. So we turned to A-L-O, A-O-L, sorry, AOL and ICQ, right? Some of you might remember. And shortly thereafter, there was this social media platform that was known as MySpace. Ooh, I'm dating myself, I realize, big time. And in the hallways of that freshman floor, AOL Instant Messenger was obviously the freshman girl platform of choice. Because in those days, at least, we would encourage our girls to keep their doors open to foster communication and community in the hall. And in doing so, one would just have to simply pass through the hall to hear those ancient sounds. Now, I had meant to bring my phone so I could play you a clip of that door opening. Your buddy was on, and when they left, close. They were gone right? You, that is coming back to some of you right now. Nostalgia, I hear it. And that's what brings me to the day that has stuck with me for almost 20 years. And what in some ways even predicted or had the ability, perhaps a foretaste of the state of our communication affairs now. So one of my duties as an RA was to mediate between roommate conflicts Oh, glamorous, very fun job. 
For most students, you don't get to choose your roommate right when you go to college. Somebody from a distance, far out office in the administration pulls two people together to be roommates. At least this was it was when I was in school. And you filled out a survey, and if you match a survey like match.com, you are put together. And sometimes, as you can expect, those roommate situations don't always work out very well. So it was the case for these two freshman girls who came to my door knocking about a month into their first year of college. I sat them down on my futon, of course, and had them hatch out their disagreement with one another. She did this, one said. She did that, and back and forth and back and forth. That usual banter of discord played out among these two college students. But then, as they divulged their conflict, it hit me suddenly that up until this point, that their entire disagreement happened online, through messenger, typing nasty things to one another and about one another. Now, remember the time period, my friends, right? Long before smartphones, tablets, and laptops, they had to sit across from one another in the exact same room at their desktops, typing, fighting, bickering, name calling, and never once getting up off their desk chair to go mend that broken relationship, go hash it out face to face. Oh no, not at all. And I look back at that moment thinking it was like an omen, predicting the breakdown of our communication and our speech today, where the seeming anonymity of electronic communication feeds our most destructive impulses. Oh, I wish I could have captured that moment and said, this is the future of communication. Little did I know. Now, some 2,000 years ago, James writes his community admonishing them about the power of that small member known as the tongue. Scarce, though, could he have imagined that it would be complemented by 10 other little members, devoid of sound except for the click, click, click of a keypad, but nonetheless still fiery and powerfully combustible in our own day. But James did know, James did know the insidious nature of what comes out of our mouths that has a power to destroy our communal life together and to deny the image of God in each other. Now these letters that we come across in the New Testament known as the epistles were always purposeful and highly intentional. These letters were intended for a specific audience about a specific set of concerns that were particular to the community into which the letters were addressed. Think of it this way. Paul writes a letter called Philemon. And in that letter to Philemon, he tells the slave owner about the potential he has to let his slave Onesimus free. Think of the letters 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. The author pens these letters to a community so embroiled in discord and in conflict and infighting that it is affecting their very witness of Jesus to the world around them. And so John implores them that as God's beloved that they ought to love one another because in loving one another, Others will know that they are Christians by that very love. And James here is no exception, albeit we have less of a record of exactly who James is writing to. To the church in Jerusalem? Maybe. Pre or post Paul? Maybe. We don't even know exactly who the James that James says he is, is the twin brother of John, one of the sons of Zebedee? Maybe. The one known as Alphaeus? Maybe. Or as tradition says, the very brother of Jesus our Lord? Perhaps. One has to wonder though, 
what was going on in this community to cause James to write and say the things he does here? Perhaps they were, as C.S. Lewis has been known to say, so heavenly minded that they were not any earthly good. Meaning that they were too wrapped up in getting something right about their beliefs that they neglected to see that faith is not simply a matter of the head and the heart, but fundamentally also the matter of the hands and the feet and here the tongue. I can't help but wonder, too, about the state of the speech in this community, the nature of their conversation that would cause James to write this discourse on the tongue. How bad did it get among them that James advises them to use a bridle and implores the the metaphor of the ship's rudder? How vicious and insidious did their talk become that James compares it to a fiery cycle of evil and of deadly poison? How two-sided did their, their mouths really appear? That they would speak words of blessing and curse, that complaints would outweigh their praise. There is this uh, professor by the name of Dr. Christine Pohl, and she wrote a book about uh, how uh, to sustain Christian communities and what are the practices that it takes to sustain Christian communities. She begins her book the same way that James began his letter to us, with gratitude. As that is the bedrock practice that feeds and nurtures communal life for the long haul deep abiding in the generosity of God, we're invited then to respond in thanksgiving and by returning generosity to one another in our life together. And in doing so, she says, Christian communities can flourish. Conversely, she says, that what zaps the life and breaks the cycle of grace and gratitude and generosity, what does this? is the culture of complaint, she says. The culture of complaint is that deathly spiral of communication that does not speak truth and love, but rather bit by bit breaks somebody down and along with it, the whole community. And it's here that I must confess that I join with James's own confession For all of us, all of us make many mistakes. Because it is very easy to be sucked up and in the vortex of complaining. Isn't it? Or is it just me? Maybe it's at the bus stop and the other moms are gathered in and we're complaining about the school or at the water cooler at work, and we talk about so-and-so and this or that. Maybe it happens in the church parking lot. Maybe. Over email? On Facebook? At first, it often begins with an offhanded remark that we don't push back against. And then sooner or later, we join the complaint chorus about so-and-so and and about this and that. And before we even realize it, we too are drenched with the same stench that comes when we play with this kind of fire. And over time, the effects can be disastrous on all fronts. Because our speech, our unwieldy tongues have the power to break each other down. So glad that Becca said that in the, in the lesson today. You can't put that toothpaste back in the tube of tooth, toothpaste. You can't take back a word. My grandmother, and if you ever see her when she comes here, you'll, you'll love her on this, who says to me, she is 70, almost 80 years old. She says, I remember in fifth grade, that somebody called me an ostrich neck when I wore a turtleneck. And she'll never wear a turtleneck to this day. They have power to break each other down. 
And not only that, to break apart the community that, we're, uh, that we are a part of and break up the image of God that we are called to bear in the world. You know, I am just one to join many of people who say, oh, the way that we talk to each other these days, the rise of incivility in our politics. But I want us to hold up that mirror as James calls us earlier in this epistle, to take a deep look at our own selves. It is at church that we get to practice being the people marked by grace, including those who have grace-filled speech. If we want the world to change around us, we have to practice it here so the world will know that we are marked as different. People who are marked by grace and love and community That's a hard thing to do. It's much easier to say, I'll join the culture of complaint. This week, my challenge is, let us recognize it first. Let us choose different words to say. And then when we fail, for we will, come to God and seek forgiveness, redemption, sanctification, and to be sent out with better words to say. Who or how is the world going to be any different if we don't go and embody these words of peace and love that Jesus commands us when we tame the tongue? All right, last week I said we are not just ones who are called to go to church, that we are called to be the church. And this is how I'm inviting, we're, I'm inviting all of us to be the church this week. And tell me about it. Tell me about what your experience is like. Email me or tell me face to face. I want to hear. All right. All God's people say, amen.